Today, October 22, is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Hello and welcome back to the Adventist History Podcast. This episode is entitled Prophecy and Plagiarism, Part 2. Last time, I introduced you to Ron Numbers, William Peterson, Roy Branson, Don McAdams, and Harold Weiss, Adventist thinkers who were encouraging the church to take a critical look at Ellen White as a subject of study, and particularly the sources she used in her writings. So if you haven't listened to part one of this series, Prophecy and Plagiarism, hit pause, go give it a listen. I'll just wait here until you get back. In this episode, however, we are going to be talking more about Ron Numbers' book, Prophetess of Health. Now, I need to begin with an important disclaimer. As many of you know, I'm a pastor, and I only devote a handful of days each month to the Adventist History Project, which has come to include four podcasts now, including this one. So this topic is one of those issues on which thousands of pages have been written, and I don't know about you, but I don't have the time to read it all before I sit down and write an episode. Not only is there a lot of written material to cover, but there are also memories and personal experiences with Prophetess of Health and Ron Numbers that are important, but that also means interviewing a bunch of people, which, again, takes time. Now, I've said time and again that this podcast is my first draft of Avenus history, and that statement applies to this episode as well. To properly evaluate both what Ron Numbers wrote, along with what the White Estate critiqued in response to him, well, that would be a research paper in and of itself. So, I'm 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 just noting things that I have observed in reading both documents and reading things that were written. Uh, around both documents. I'm not trying to weigh in on the veracity of these claims and counterclaims. Someday, I may come back to this episode and re-record it, and I will let you know when I do, but just take this as the first draft on this subject, not the final draft on this subject. If you're writing a research paper, don't just cite my podcast. Go and do the work yourself as well, but hopefully, hopefully, this is a good place for you to start in accessing this subject. I don't see myself as your teacher. I'm just your group partner who happened to also do 100% of the studying. (laughs) All right, on with the show. In some ways, Ronald Numbers was an unlikely vector to challenge the church. Numbers' father was a pastor in Las Vegas, then wrapping up four decades of service to the church. Numbers' grandfather has been, had been, the General Conference President in the early 1950s. Of course, I'm talking about W.H. Branson. Numbers, his uncle was a General Conference Field Secretary. Another uncle was a popular evangelist. Numbers, his cousin was Roy Branson, an ethics professor at the seminary. So Ron Numbers had good reasons not to want to rock the boat. But if his family constrained any impulse to rock the boat, his family also encouraged it. Ron and Roy had briefly taught together at Andrews when Branson and Harold Weiss were working on their essay calling for a scholarly study of Ellen White. How could a young professor not want to use the tools of his trade to study what had never been studied before, to break new ground, to contribute in a new field? There was another reason to study Ellen White. Truth. Number said, Quote, the ultimate cause prompting me to write what I did was, I think, to discover the truth, end quote. Numbers and Branson also helped found the Association of Adventist Forums, which began publishing its journal, you might have heard of it, it's called Spectrum, and infused it with the same value of speaking freely without regard for what I'll call churchy deference. Now, Ron Numbers, as his name might suggest, had a degree from what is now Southern Adventist University in mathematics. But he switched to history when he went to Florida State for his master's degree and, finally, a Ph.D. from the University of California, Berkeley. After spending a year teaching at Andrews with his cousin, he was moved to Loma Linda to teach a course on the history of medicine to medical students. 
Now, on the first day of class, a student showed up and circulated a petition demanding that the course be canceled. So, you know, auspicious beginning. The course was canceled. Numbers then tried again, this time focusing on the history of health teachings in the Adventist church, thinking that would be of far more interest to the future doctors of the church. So Ron headed to the Loma Linda University Medical Library to do some research for the course. He happened upon a metal cage with books inside. In the cage, he happened upon a copy of a book by Larkin Coles, an old health reformer. In the margins, he found shorthand notations in John Harvey Kellogg's distinctive hand. And once he was able to decipher Kellogg's code, which, by the way, should be the next Avenus novel, The Kellogg Code by not Dan Brown. Anyways, once he was able to decipher Kellogg's code, he realized that Kellogg had noted places where Larkin Coles and Ellen White said much the same thing. So naturally, that got numbers thinking, did Ellen White really get all of these health ideas from visions? How does what she taught differ or resemble what other health reformers were teaching in her day? Since Peterson and McAdams were already finding evidence of Ellen White's reliance on historians, might the same be true for her ideas on health as well? To answer these questions, numbers needed access to White estate resources. But when Arthur White, Ellen White's grandson, saw the kinds of topics that numbers wanted to explore, he feared that they had another Peterson or McAdams on their hands. So Arthur White flew to Loma Linda to size up Ron Numbers. And at one point, Arthur White apparently brandished and appealed to mothers, which was a small tract Ellen White had written about the dangers of masturbation in 1864. Brother Numbers, Arthur asked, do you believe this? In other words, do you believe Ellen White was inspired or not? Which is certainly one of the most uncomfortable tests of one's fealty to the prophet that I could possibly imagine. (laughs) Numbers was permitted to continue, but he was given a minder from the White Estate to keep an eye on things. This was a young adult named Ronald Graybill. Graybill had apparently distinguished himself in responding to Peterson's article, and now he was tasked with ensuring that Ron Numbers doesn't become the next Peterson. This, Arthur White referred to as the Ron Numbers Matter. What Arthur White didn't know was that Ron Graybill was something of a double agent. Now, I'm not going to say too much about Ron Graybill here, because while I have sources of what he said and did, they tend to be sources aligned with Ron Numbers, and since Graybill is alive, I would rather just ask him myself how much of these things are true or exactly how it went down. But why do I say he was a double agent? Because while Graybill did keep the interests of the White Estate in mind and recognized that his book was destined to be a crisis of the first magnitude, as he put it, Graybill also gave files to numbers that he never would have found without help from someone on the inside, which greatly strengthened the book's argument, something that numbers acknowledged later on. After all, Graybill could have been mulish and given Numbers as little as possible. could have even misdirected him. And at one point, Numbers basically told Graybill that you may be the White Estate's favorite son today, but you won't be forever. In other words, Ron to Ron, pick a side. After Numbers finished the first draft of Prophetess of Health, and it began to take shape, he gave it to five colleagues for feedback. And as so often happens in these stories, the manuscripts leaked. They were copied they were sold for $5. Numbers was either fired or resigned. There are conflicting tales on exactly which happened first, and there was talk of disfellowshipping him. And there was also a whole conspiracy later on, a whole conspiracy over how this book was able to be published while he was teaching at Loma Linda, or wasn't published while he was at Loma Linda, but but it was written while he was at Loma Linda. Did Graham Maxwell secretly fund it? I mean, people... People stole financial records to try to find the the culprit here and all of this kind of stuff. And and later on, uh, heads would begin to roll on Loma Linda's campus. People who were suspected of having secretly helped numbers, or even if those suspicions didn't bear fruit, some people were just gotten rid of uh, for other reasons. 
but they secretly may have been due to their connection to Ron numbers. But uh, ostensibly, they were officially let go or transferred or pressured uh, for other reasons. At this point, it's worth asking the question I'm sure most of you are wondering about. What exactly is in this book? What was the bombshell? And that's just the thing. Uh, there was no bombshell. There was no one bombshell. Numbers didn't conclude. See, that's why Ellen White isn't a prophet. Boom. This was no can right. The impact, I would say, that Prophetess of Health made wasn't in what it asserted loudly, but what it said quietly and consistently. It told the story of how Ellen White became a health reformer without relying upon her visions, without showing her any kind of special deference, and by strongly, strongly suggesting that she really got her ideas from other people. It's a simple presentation of Ellen White without the halo. It's like a biography of Napoleon or of Abraham Lincoln. They're just telling what happened without without the, the, the hagiography, without the deference, without the, uh, the, the, the great respect for the subject, without trying to lionize them. It was just Ellen White as a normal person. Now, Numbers demonstrates how similar some of Ellen White's statements are with those of other writers of her day, something Kellogg, too, of course, had noticed. For instance, Ellen White wrote that more deaths have been caused by drug-taking than by all other causes combined. Now, by drug taking, she doesn't mean like heroin or something. She just means uh, prescribed drugs back in the day. Numbers then cites a health reformer named Larkin Coles, we talked about him earlier, as saying, quote, there is more damage than good done with medicine, end quote. Coles's book had been published 15 years before Ellen White would, would have her vision and make her statement. And besides, the idea, we, we should acknowledge, the idea of medicine being more dangerous than the disease was a common, common quip in 19th century America, in the, in the middle of the 19th century especially. And that's something that Oliver Wendell Holmes memorably observed in 1860, just a few years before Ellen White's health vision, when he said, quote, I firmly believe that if the whole materia medica, that is prescribed medicine, as now used, could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes, end quote. Fishes? Holmes? Really? Fishes? Anyways, you get his point. Numbers didn't have to spell it out. The pious Avenist reading this book would be led to wonder, did Ellen White not get these ideas in vision as we had believed? Avenist had often chirped that Ellen White was a hundred years ahead of her time about these things, that modern medical science was only just now catching up. But what if her health claims weren't very original? What if God wasn't the source for these uh, century ahead of time insights that she had? What if there were other health reformers who were 150 years ahead of their time and Ellen White had only borrowed their ideas? This was the grave implication. And so when I say there's no bombshells in this book, I don't mean that there, there's no like... I don't know, she had a second husband that she never told anybody about kind of stuff. But it's just this quiet chipping away at, the, at, the, at Ellen White on the pedestal, at the things that Avenus had believed about Ellen White for so, for so long, and it was done in a very careful, a very scholarly way, that cumulatively, it was a bombshell. But there was no, like, you know, not like you grab uh, some political figure's memoir, you know, and then the, the media gets a hold of it, and they're like, oh... Did you know this? And did you know that? Oh, we never knew. You know, these are huge deals. Rather, it was more of an unmasking of Ellen White. That was the bombshell. But not any one particular claim, necessarily. So, what do we do with Ellen White? Prophetess of Health was like a construction roller that just slowly crushed the ground in front of it, foot by foot by foot. There was none of that arm-waving that bitter critics of Adventism might do to dramatize their disappointment or to build the following. This was scholarly and clinical. He never claimed Ellen White was a phony or a fraud. Nevertheless, numbers certainly, certainly pushed his readers in that direction, 
usually in subtle ways, although not always. He writes that as Ellen White began talking about her health vision, her listeners would note the similarities between what she was saying and these other health reformers and then ask her whether she had read their writings. Numbers writes, quote, her stock reply was that she had not and would not until she had fully written out her views, end quote. Then he quotes Ellen White's reason for this, quote, lest it should be said that I received my light upon the subject of health from physicians and not from the Lord, end quote. Numbers concludes, quote, the embarrassing questions persisted until finally she issued a formal statement in the Review and Herald disclaiming any familiarity with health reform publications, end quote. The circumstantial evidence numbers presented left readers to conclude that Ellen White simply had to be familiar with these health reform ideas before she had her health reform vision. After all, Joseph Bates had adopted all sorts of health reforms before 1844. J.P. Kellogg taught his sons Merritt, John Harvey, and Will Keith the principles of health reform as taught in the Water Cure Journal. John Loughborough read the same journal in 1848. Shucks, even William Miller's right-hand man, Joshua V. Himes, began publishing health reform ideas in his paper in 1861. Uriah Smith's sister, Annie, was a patient at a health institution in 1855. In February 1863, Ellen's husband, James, began publishing some of this information on the front page of the review. James called for fresh air, clean water, and sunlight saying that these were God's great remedies and so much more valuable than doctors and their drugs. Thus, Numbers concludes, by the time Illinois had her health reform vision, quote, Seventh-day Adventists were already in possession of the main outlines of the health reform message, end quote. Does that prove that Illinois borrowed her health ideas from these other reformers or from her fellow believers who had borrowed them from, their, from these health reformers? Does it prove that Ellen White faked a vision and lied about it. No, she was careful when she said that her views were written independent of the books or opinions of others. She may very well have never read a book on health reform, and she may very well have not been influenced by what she considered to be mere opinions, but that is, admittedly, a very fine needle to thread. The point is, there is room for a reasonable explanation here, though perhaps not a lot of room. The sheer number of people around her, including her own husband, who was teaching and publishing some of the things Ellen later claimed to have seen in vision, needs explanation. And by the time she did publish what she saw in vision, some of the words, phrases, and ideas seem directly taken from these health reformers, though not word for word. Numbers points out that Ellen White made mistakes in recounting the sequence of events around her health vision. She said James ordered books on these health reform subjects after seeing them advertised in Joshua Himes' paper in September 1863, but James had actually ordered them long before then. She claimed that when the books arrived, she left them unopened because she didn't want to be influenced by them. But James had already opened at least one of them and mailed it to a friend. These are things, by the way, that the White estate acknowledged. Both sides could acknowledge that she wasn't perfect, even if many members believed she was as close as you can get. Now, like I said, Ron Numbers stopped short of saying that she was a fraud or dishonest, but the circumstances, the circumstances around her writing out her health views were suspicious to say the least. In the end, Numbers leaves it up to the reader to decide what this information means for Ellen White's claim to be inspired by God. Well, you might be wondering, if Ron Numbers was writing all of these things, why did Ron Graybill and Arthur White help him find resources at the White Estate? The answer is that no one knew for sure in the beginning where Ron Numbers was going to be going with this research. Ron Numbers himself probably didn't realize where he would be going. He set out in the beginning just to chronicle the history of, of the health message in the Adventist Church. It wasn't until he stumbled upon Kellogg's book that it got him asking some more focused questions uh, about you know, how much she may have relied upon these other health reformers in her day. Even when it was clear which direction this project was headed, I suspect there was perhaps some hope that the project could be steered if the White Estate stayed engaged. Graybill often alerted numbers to documents that would be valuable, such as a recently rediscovered document 
that shows Ellen White taking her children to get phrenological readings of their heads. Phrenology, if you aren't aware, was a pseudoscientific practice in those days where the shape of one's head was supposed to give one insight into a person's character. If you had a lump or a groove or a bump over on this part of your skull, well, they mapped it kind of to the brain that was underneath that part portion of the skull and what that region of the brain suggests. And so it was kind of a way of discerning one's character based on the shape of the skull. According to numbers, he went to the White Estate weeks later to ask if there was anything about Ellen White getting a reading of her head. And according to him, Arthur White lied and said they hadn't seen any documents like that. Now, that is a serious accusation, and I certainly cannot tell what actually happened. But even if it's not true, the very accusation shows how complicated and tense the relationship could be between numbers, the White Estate, and Ron Graybill often playing towards both sides. By the way, I'm going to ask Ron Graybill if he wants to talk about the subject of this episode, share some of his memories from those days. If he does, I'll put the interview on Avenus History Extra. That's my podcast just for our patrons and supporters. And you can join the team over at patreon.com slash History Podcast, or go on to our website at avenushistoryproject.org, and you can find a place to get access to Avenus History Extra there as well. Anyways, one of Ron Numbers' colleagues at Loma Linda, Vern Carner, had so believed in Ron's research into this area that it was actually his idea to encourage Ron to write a book on it. Vern even assured Ron that he would find a publisher for him. At first, they tried Erdman's, but Erdman's brushed Numbers off politely. They would later, by the way, come back and publish the third edition and most recent edition of the book. Instead, it was Harper and Rowe who decided to publish the book. Now, that would normally be the end of the tale, but apparently it wasn't. And you know what? I'm going to let Ron Numbers himself explain. Yeah. Arthur White had, had gone up to uh, New York to meet with my publisher, uh, expecting that he could convince the publisher at Harper's uh, that this book was so flawed, this manuscript was so flawed, they shouldn't publish it. Well... The editor uh, told uh, Arthur White, "Well, send your criticisms to Ron so he can so he can correct any errors that are in there." Well, it was too ad hominem for uh, Arthur White to agree to that. So that's why the White Estate arranged that two people I knew well would come to Madison for a weekend. Uh, and go over each chapter with me so that I wouldn't uh, be too upset. With the draft of the book finally completed, Graybill and the head of the history department at Andrews, Richard Shores, met numbers to go through the book one last time, chapter by chapter. And here's how Jonathan Butler tells that story. And, you know, he had a draft in, in hand of his book, Prophet as of Health. Then Graybill... And Richard Schwartz, who was an historian and the chair of the history department at Andrews, the two of them sat down with Ron's uh, dissertation, uh, Ron's book in draft form, across from Ron, and they went over it line by line. They and, had a folder for each chapter. Yeah, and each. I mean, I'm telling this story. You should tell this. But, but the, the point was that if they both agreed, if both Schwartz and Graybill agreed that this ought to be out of there or, or rewritten or whatever, Ron said, I will do it. But if one of you sides with me and the other is against uh, the two of us, then I'm going to leave it in. And so everything you see in Prophetess of Hell is, is agreed upon by one of those two guys and Ron. After years of submitting the manuscript to scrutiny, after losing his job and moving across the country and starting over, Prophetess of Health was finally published in 1976. There was some confusion over how the church should treat it. Was this an Avenus book? Was it an ex-Avenist book? Is it supportive of Ellen White? Is it against Ellen White? 
Walla Walla College Library decided to purchase a copy, but they kept it behind the desk and only loaned it to those who had obtained special permission. And there were others who debated whether or not they should buy and read the book. Now, as you might expect, the White Estate didn't watch all of this unfold with disinterest. An essay by Richard Schwarz pointed out Numbers' forgivable tendency to oversimplify, but and forgivable but easily misunderstood, as well as the, the, the value judgment that Numbers made in terms of how much weight to put on his sources. Uh, let me just give you a quick example of that. If John Harvey Kellogg wrote something about Ellen White, do you just assume that what he said was true? I mean, this is somebody who had at one point quarreled with Ellen White, eventually, of course, depending on what you're going to quote, may have already been outside of the church. How reliable of a witness is John Harvey Kellogg? And so sometimes historians, as they're citing primary sources, it's like, well, how much do you really trust what this person is saying is true? Ellen White has her own agenda, of course, but so does Kellogg. And so some people in critiquing Numbers' book will say you relied a little bit too much on sources that you should have been more skeptical of. Now, Schwartz was clear that he didn't believe Ron Numbers was a villain. He wasn't dishonest or malicious. And if the end result of Prophetess of Health is that people study Ellen White more carefully, then Numbers has, in Schwartz's words, performed a service. The White Estate staff, on the other hand, took issue with Numbers' defense of a secular approach to history, where the historian doesn't assume God had inspired Ellen White when writing about her, just write about her the same way you'd write about anybody else in history. And this is what Numbers had forecast in his first published article for the denomination, that article in Spectrum. We talked about it in our last episode. It was a book review entitled In Defense of Secular History. The White Estate staff vigorously disputed the secular history approach, arguing, quote, If Ellen G. White is to be on trial, it should not be in the court of opinion where secularist rules prevail. We merely insist that there is more to life, more to truth, more to history than can be explained for in a secular mechanistic framework, end quote. More on that in a minute. The White Estate would point out that she was never totally clueless about health before her 1863 vision. She had had a vision in 1848 about the dangers of tobacco, tea, and coffee, for instance. Are we to believe that before her vision she had never heard that tobacco was dangerous? Well, I'm sure she had. Joseph Bates, after all, had long since given up tobacco, tea, and coffee. So what, is God just showing her much of what she already knew? when he gave her the vision in 1863? Perhaps. The visions were not always about giving Ellen White new information, but they often conveyed urgency. They often helped her focus on what the next direction should be for a person, for a family, for an institution, or for the entire church. So whatever new information she may have gleaned from the 1863 vision, the biggest change was that she was now convinced that health reform was a task for the entire church. The White Estate also points out that even if various other Adventists had some notion of these health reform principles, they were often practiced inconsistently and incompletely, except perhaps for Joseph Bates. No one else had a comprehensive idea of health until after the 1863 vision. That's what seems to have changed after 1863. The White Estate used a statement from J.H. Wagner in 1866 to explain how, quote, We do not profess to be pioneers in the general principles of the health reform. The facts on which this movement is based have been elaborated in a great measure by reformers, physicians, and writers on physiology and hygiene, and so may be found scattered throughout the land. But we do claim that by the method of God's choice, it has been more clearly and powerfully unfolded and is thereby producing an effect which we could not have looked for from any other means, end quote. In other words, we Adventists aren't claiming that our ideas about health are original, only that God has revealed them to us in such a way that they produce an effect which could not have been gotten through other means. According to Wagner, it is the effect of the vision 
not necessarily every individual piece of information in the vision which is special and where we can find the fingerprints of God. As I said, a lot of the differences between Numbers and the White Estate came down to two different philosophical approaches to history and, to a lesser extent, the personalities and persons involved. For instance, the White Estate response took Numbers to task in many places, from how often Ellen White might have had sex to... Well, I'm not even going to finish that sentence because there's no way you're still listening after starting the sentence by talking about how much Ellen White had sex. So let's move on. What's that? Oh, now you're curious? Okay, fine. Numbers speculates that following Sylvester Graham, Ellen believed you should only have sex once a month. The White Estate points out that she never actually commented on this subject, thanks be to God, and it's only a somewhat educated guess. For church people who hold Ellen White in the greatest esteem, however, this kind of speculation is perhaps understandably disturbing. Like, why even speculate? It seems gratuitous and disrespectful to do this, to, to speculate on how often a beloved figure believed that we should have sex when this beloved figure never actually talked about it. For a scholar dispassionately studying his subject, however, it is a reasonable thing to note, if highly speculative. Some of this, as I said, concerned personalities. Numbers' chapter on this was called Short Skirts and Sex, which shows his eye for being provocative and edgy. Church leaders, understandably, were less amused by being provocative and edgy. Elsewhere, Numbers characterized Ellen White as being half-hearted, undress reforms, and, as quoted earlier, said the questions about where she got her health ideas were embarrassing. Numbers talks about her flirtation with phrenology and Ellen White's short skirt crusade. Now, words and phrases like these make for more energetic prose. It's certainly more entertaining, but they can also come across as gratuitous dunks on Ellen White to people who deeply value her. Numbers' approach to history accounts for how he interpreted that history. His operating question was, in his words, quote, how much can I explain without invoking God, end quote. And that should be the beginning of a fascinating conversation about how we do history as believers. But alas, that isn't the theme of today's episode. Now, Numbers' friend, Jonathan Butler, would later characterize Ron's approach to doing history as being guided by a uh, hermeneutic of suspicion. Ron was rigorous in his research. He infinitely valued good scholarship over pious niceties. He was sharp with his critics and enjoyed goading his friends. When Avinus mentioned him in a paper presented halfway around the world and decades after Ron left the church, he would find out, and he could be slow to forgive. But Ron was also generous and good-natured, maintaining deep friendships with some Adventists for the rest of his life. While it was natural for Avinus to feel attacked by prophetess of health, not everyone saw it that way. Ernest Sandine, the foremost expert on the history of fundamentalism at that time, wrote his own review of Numbers' book for Spectrum. Sandine acknowledged the problem that faced all Christian historians. If we accept that our heroes in history were not, as we once believed, above history, above the forces and beliefs and currents of thought in their world, then are we left with a purely secular history without God in it? As Sandine put it, quote, When the historian and the believer are the same person, the writing of a book can become an enterprise fraught with tension and, occasionally, agony. One must be an obtuse reader, indeed, not to see this tension and even feel this agony in the pages of Numbers' book. That Numbers cares deeply about the history of Ellen G. White is apparent on almost every page. End quote. And this is something, it's really curious to me how observant Sandine was on this point. Because at Ron Numbers' funeral, one of the themes by Jonathan Butler and uh, by Eric Anderson uh, was how Adventist Ron Numbers remained. He was, it seems, to the end of his life, a vegetarian. He didn't dance, and he constantly wrote about Ellen White. So there's two books this one, Prophetess of Health, is known more to Adventists, but the one that's known more to the scholarly community is called The Creationists, where he sees Ellen White as the, the, the mother of creationism, of this movement that 
that uh, really emerged in the 20th century. And so as he writes his history on creationism, he's talking about Ellen White and introducing Ellen White to people who, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to understand today. But, you know, if you would read the encyclopedia, more often than not, you would find that if Adventists were mentioned at all, William Miller was considered the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. People didn't know who Ellen White was. And yet here in his popular works, whether it's uh, Prophetess of Health or whether it's The Creationist or the papers he presented at different conventions and talks he gave, Ron Numbers talked about Ellen White a lot. And while obviously he didn't talk as somebody who believed that she was a prophet and encouraged other people to believe in her as well, people got to know Ellen White because of him. And Sandine picked up on that very, very, very early. Um, and Butler would later as well, in an essay that he wrote for Church History, he would say that uh, that for numbers, his Adventist upbringing was like Hotel California, you know, that song by the Eagles, where you can check in, but you don't really check out. And even though he walked away from the church, as we'll talk about more in a few minutes, there was a sense that, that uh, well, I'll just put it this way. Whenever people leave any faith, they tend to take some things with them. And Ron Numbers took a lot of Adventist practices, ideas, subjects with him. In fact, one could argue that for the rest of his life, he never could leave Adventism behind. Whether he was talking about creation science, whether he was talking about um, Ellen White and the history of uh, medicine in the Adventist context, he never really could get away from her. And Sandine noticed that very early, as I'm sure some of Ron's other friends in the Adventist Church did as well. Sandine believed that Numbers had done Adventism a service by forcing Adventists to confront important questions. And the question that remained for the Church, according to Sandine, was, would the Church close ranks and defend Ellen White as this mythological figure? Or would this be a moment Adventists have an open and much-needed conversation about Ellen White. While well, Fritz Guy, a college dean at Loma Linda, was happy to have that conversation, his review was entitled, What Should We Expect from a Prophet? He, like other Adventist intellectuals, called out areas where numbers was wrong, but nevertheless valued the book. Guy noted a number of areas where Adventists had to do research, what is the relationship between pursuing health and salvation by grace alone? Are we damned by donuts? That's, that's how I would rephrase that question. <laughs> More importantly, Guy wanted to see the church take the sum total of Ellen White's writings on health and come up with a comprehensive theological narrative. What really was the health message back then, and what might it be today? This is a work, I will note, that still hasn't been done. Some Adventists responded in less noble ways, playing armchair psychologists and claiming that Numbers was rebelling against his conservative childhood or he, he had some kind of axe to grind against the church because, after all, he was fired or quit. I'm not, I don't know that anybody knows what actually happened first, but both things happened at about the same time from Loma Linda. So, you know, maybe he had some bad blood there and now he's going he's gonna to get back at the church. Uh, some said that, Satan was controlling Ron Numbers and leading him to attack the church. Fritz Guy clucked his tongue at such attacks, uh, these ad hominem attacks, though Numbers himself, I'm not going to blame him for the things people said about him, but he didn't always help things, let's just put it that way. When talking about his treatment of Ellen White, he was always careful, of course, to say that he wasn't calling her a false prophet, and this prevented many people, maybe most people, from labeling him some grumpy ex Adventist who had an axe to grind. But but sometimes his statements didn't help his cause, as he was quoted saying, quote, Plagiarism implies a conscious effort to deceive. Another middle ground we have to explore more fully is her mental health, end quote. A reporter summarized this view delicately, saying, quote, She might have been a little nuts, end quote. Numbers seemed ready with catchy sound bites, like, quote, If Ellen White was inspired, she didn't need to be inspired, end quote. In other words, everything she claimed was uh, that she received in vision, she could have received by contemporary health reformers, like just pick up a book and you would have got the same information. Uh, 
And if Ellen White could have received this information from others, Numbers argues, then she probably did, right? Because we're not going to tell her story assuming that God is involved. If it was possible to get these ideas from these other books, then that's what she probably did. There's no need to insert God into the story. Perhaps the hardest response came from Ron's own father. As Jonathan Butler, his friend, tells it, Ron's other grandfather had been embroiled in a scandal, and his son, Ron's father, had devoted his life to clearing the family name through loyal pastoral service. And that mission was nearly complete when Ron published Prophetess of Health. Ron's father was heartbroken, asking, quote, Was I unreasonable as a parent in the way I raised you? End quote. It was as if he was asking, Where did I go wrong? Was I a bad parent? Was it my fault? Did I do something that you wrote this book against the church? His father was unable to talk to Ron at first, so he wrote his daughter, quote, Satan has no right to steal you or Ronnie away from what you were born for. End quote. And yet Ron and his father maintained mutual affection and respect, belying the idea that this was some kind of rebellion against his father. Now, you've heard me talk about Ron as an ex-Adventist, a former Adventist, and while that may have been the inevitable conclusion after publishing a book like this, the breaking point happened after Ron had moved to Madison, Wisconsin to take up his new job at the University of Wisconsin in the summer of 1974. His book was still two years away from being published, but copies of it were already known and, and spreading. He began attending the Adventist Church in Madison when he got there. After all, it was a new city and a new part of the country. He still wanted to enjoy Adventist community, even if he wasn't 100% on board with everything Adventists believed. He thought he could remain a cultural Adventist. Robert Olson of the White Estate then showed up to do a weekend seminar and Ellen White. Now, Ron, of course, was the real target, and he knew it. So, not wanting to create a scene, he left, and he never looked back. Naturally, the mere hint that Ellen White was mistaken was enough of a scandal for many Adventists. Larry Mitchell, a professor at PUC, that's Pacific Union College, who would find himself under fire for teaching quote-unquote modern scholarship, recalled that, quote, I remember an address given here at PUC in the 1960s by a close relative of the prophetess herself. The principal point of this particular address has stayed with me to this day. It was that Ellen White was not at all dependent on any human being for any of her messages. As a good student, I took that point to heart. The fact must not be missed or minimized that many Adventist pastors who are today struggling with their own understanding of the authority of Ellen White originally built their theological house around this view which denied her dependency. End quote. Mitchell feels that he and other Adventists have been betrayed because they had been led to believe that every word Ellen White wrote was inspired by God. Betrayal is the key word here because it's not, it's not that church leaders didn't know about these issues. The minutes of the 1919 Bible Conference had just been found and published and it was clear to everyone that church leaders had known about this stuff for generations. So the fact that some Adventists, as Mitchell puts it, want to tear down their own theological house and then burn whatever is left, that's what he, I didn't quote that part, but he went on to say that, it was entirely preventable. If only the church had been told, if only the members had been told, no one would have to have this feeling of betrayal. Quote, instead, in a sense, we championed ignorance, encouraged ignorance, enlisted ignorance, and outfitted it for battle, and then rewarded it. Is there any wonder that we have reaped the harvest that misinformation, disinformation, and fear of information can produce? End quote. Walter Ott, a historian at Pacific Union College, felt much the same way. While he didn't agree with how Numbers handled some of his facts and his sources, he also acknowledged that, quote, the difficult problems for us in a book like this we have made for ourselves, end quote. Like Mitchell, Utt pointed the finger at how the church had allowed members to believe that Ellen White was completely inerrant. Now, if you ask me, this is the moment that broke the relationship between members and church leaders, and it has not been the same since. Robert H. Pearson could go on about liberalism infiltrating the church all day long, but liberalism didn't do this. 
Conservatism didn't do this. Fear did this. Church leaders over generations didn't want to tell the members the truth. They didn't want to investigate it themselves. They threatened and labeled those who wanted to study Ellen White. They fostered what George Knight has called the wonderful world of Ellen White. And it all came crashing down. Or did it? Larry Mitchell made a curious observation about his students. Quote, In the last few years, significant information has come to light about the process by which Ellen White wrote. I've had students tell me, in essence, that they didn't want to know this information. Am I completely off target when I suggest that some of these students may not want to know about recent Ellen White research because they are unwilling to re-examine or examine for the first time their understanding of Ellen White's authority? End quote. The path forward for some people was to pretend that nothing ever happened. It is one thing, Mitchell wrote, quote, to be miserably ignorant. It is quite another thing to be defensively and militantly ignorant, end quote. It wouldn't be until after the Walter Ray affair, which we're going to talk about in the next episode, that a church committee recommended that the members of the church be educated on how Ellen White used sources. So let's take a break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about Walter Ray's book, The White Lie, in our next episode. By the way, this episode marks the ninth anniversary of doing this podcast month after month after month on the 22nd of every month for nine years. I think the only time I took a month off was in between season one and two. I think I took like one month off. Well, I don't know how many of you have been listening for around nine years or even most of nine years, but when I blow out the candles on that cake tonight, it's with gratitude for all of you. So thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.